a very different model. And as a result of being decentralized, a healthy productive system has a lot of small units. So the one of the things you want to do is you want to constantly create the nurturing of how do I spin off small things. For example, when Zoo Atlanta became privatized, instead of the mayor of Atlanta spending five minutes every three months thinking about Zoo Atlanta, you had a full-time director and a president of, 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 of the Zoo Atlanta, of, of the Friends of the Zoo, who worked on it every day, all day, because they now had control and they were in charge. It went from $850,000 budget to a $9 million budget. It went from being almost disaccredited because it was so bad to being a world-class research zoo. It's all, totally privatized. All the funding is now private. No, there's no tax money left. And by decentralizing away from the city of Atlanta to that unit doing its own thing, we have dramatically changed how it operates. And one of the reasons the post office is failing, frankly, is the, that, it, that it's, it's neither fish nor fowl. We, we're neither said to it, you're now in charge, good luck. Nor do we take it under the government and say, we're going to reshape you because we're in charge. So you have a bunch of guys who aren't really in charge because the rules are set by the Congress, and then the work rules are set by the union negotiations, and then it's a mess. And you'd be much, much better off to decide decisively how do you want to get it run and then run it. And get it away from uh, the federal government, which can't think about these things. I mean, you can't think about Bosnia, Chechnya, Somalia, Haiti, Rwanda, turn and think about the entire national economy, and then micromanage a system of 800,000 employees. You have nobody, nobody has that kind of span of control. So what you want to do is have lots of smaller units. You want to constantly de devolve things away, get them back to somebody who can actually do something. A healthy, productive system is best educated and shaped by markets. I'm lost now. What are you doing? Let me go back and try again. If you look at the notion of, of marketplaces, what we're suggesting here is that, that to truly shape things, you want to have the market making the decisions. Not, not the bureaucracy, not the politicians, not the academic elite, not the lawyers, but the marketplace. And you want to find out some way so that, so that you have choice. You want, and in a funny way, it means you're constantly thinking about you as a consumer. How do I maximize your right to choose? Your right to choose in health care, your right to choose in education, your right to choose in government services. If there's not some overwhelming reason for it to be a government monopoly, why not simply decentralize it and dump it in the market? even if the government wants to do it. Have the government do it in a competitive manner. Now, it's also fair to say that as a result, if you're going to have a very decentralized system with lots of small units running around focused on the markets, that a healthy, productive system has a lot of leaders. And that that model of having a lot of leaders means you've got to think about a system where it's not who's the president or who's the speaker or who's the governor. But it's who's doing something neat today. So Bill Gates shows up. He, he dropped out from college. He never got a degree. And he happens to be worth billions of dollars. And he runs Microsoft, which happens to be the most heavily capitalized co uh, company after GM in the world. Or somebody else shows up. You know, Steve Jobs drops out of college and invents Apple computing. Or Spielberg creates uh, Jurassic Park. I mean, what works is what works. This goes back to, remember, pragmatism? How can you tell what works? Because it's working. And what happens is credentialed people and academics and bureaucrats want to have something that, that gives them stability. They want to decide what works. And so very often they will define the most grotesque failure as, as a, a good step in the right direction. You know, there are, have you ever noticed there are no public failures? I mean, you know, if, if McDonald's did as bad at, at, at serving the customer as public housing, we would not only bankrupt it, we'd probably put the head of McDonald's in jail. But there are no public failures. By if you put the word public in front of something, it's morally good. That's an example of what happened in the mid-20th century. Well, I mean, why is it morally good? Why should the word public mean anything except that it's a great word? And yet, you can talk about people and you can say, well, public spokesman for. As though private is bad. But what we're suggesting here is that what you want to test is, does it really work? What are the real products? Let me tell you, you measure much of modern government by that test, it's gone. If you measure much of education by that test, it's gone. If you measure a lot of health care by that test, it's gone. Because if you go to the customers and you say, are you happy? Do you think you're getting the best product? Is something actually working? You'll suddenly discover that they're being coerced by the legal power of the state 
to engage in behaviors they would not voluntarily engage in in which they don't think are very productive. And so what you want to do is you want to say, all right, by definition, you show me something real big and I'll show you something we should rethink. And that includes the Pentagon. I mean, I'm not, I'm not standing here saying, let's just look at everything but. I'm saying you look across the board. And then you've got to say, if you, want, if you want the society to get something done, try to keep it private, try to keep it small, try to keep it decentralized, try to find local leaders who, who grow by doing, which is totally different than a credentialed, centrally bureaucratically planned system. And then you come back to the notion, which is really a scary part of this, that entrepreneurial free enterprise includes the right to fail. It's very important. I mean, if you're not going to let people fail, why do you think they're going to learn? And if you have a school system that says, I don't, as long as you show up, I'll give you a C. Even if you can't read, I'll at least promote you because we don't need to feel bad about yourself. Nonsense. If you're, if you're 9 or 10 years old and you can't read, I want you to feel terrible about yourself. I want you to say to yourself, I have got to buckle down here and learn this because I am never going to get a job in my whole life. I, mean, I want you to feel miserable if you can't read when you're 15. And I want you to say, I feel so miserable, I'm going to start learning how to read. And if we say, well, it's really socially acceptable because we know you mean well and we don't want to in any way impair your, your self-esteem. Baloney! If you can't read, I want you to have terrible self-esteem and then buckle down and learn how to read. Yes, it's scary. But the truth is, you can't read. If you can't read, you can't get a job. If you can't get a job, you don't have money. If you don't have money, you don't have any power. So now we've said, we want you to be this powerless person with a lot of self-esteem. <laughs> and we've lost our minds. There's no harm in failing. I keep telling that to my friends. I ran twice and lost. My first try at writing a novel was so bad that Alvin Toffler's agent wrote back and said, I assume you shake hands better than you write fiction. <laughs> that did actually stop me for four or five years. I decided, I mean. <laughs> but I bounced back after a while, and I'm back again. I've got a new novel coming out. I mean, you know, you can't, but my point is, you know, every, every almost every, not everyone, but almost every successful writer can show you the first five manuscripts. I mean, you know, Hemingway was once asked to write a thousand words on how to become a writer. And he said, the key to writing is, and he then, he then wrote in the word write for the next 994 times. You know, I, I talked to Jack Kemp the other day about it. He, he, he was desperate to be a pro football player. He worked out four times a day. He would throw 500 passes a day all summer. And he was just, it was, it was his thing when he was a young guy. He had to do it. And it's hard. 